Go again. Yes. You hit it. You hit it. You hit a nice. Oops. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Edwards for uh, University of Wyoming Extension. This is Barnyards and Backyards Live. And uh, re ready or not, Leroy, we're, uh, we're going to do this thing today. My co-host is um, Jeremiah Vardaman. He is up in the Powell area. And uh, you probably will hear but will not see Jennifer Thompson. Um, she kind of holds the glue for the program together and, and uh, keeps us going. Um, wanted to go over a few things before we got started. Uh, if you are new to Facebook, excuse me, if you're new to Zoom, uh, if you take your mouse and scroll over the page, you will see some buttons at the bottom. If you have uh, questions or comments for us, please use the chat or the Q&A boxes. Enter your question or comment there. And uh, if it's a question you'd like us to answer, we'll pull it forward and uh, get it asked. And you can do the same thing if you're watching on Facebook, just enter, a, we're monitoring that. So just enter it into the comment section and we'll pull it forward and uh, get your question out and going. And um, Jeremiah, good morning. I kind of I kind of talked right over the top of you today and I apologize. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's that kind of morning, but yeah. No, yeah, we, we have a really good presentation going on today and, and please bring those questions forward. That's why we're doing this. Uh, we're trying to bring this information to you and help you get started this spring and, and have a good growing season. So, very good. So, uh, yeah. Leroy, good, good morning. Yes, good morning, I yes. think. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, it's going to be just fine. <laughs> as long as the train stays on the track and the engineer doesn't have a wreck. So our, our topic today is uh, brambleberries, but we might drift off into some other things. And if we get too far deep into the weeds, Jeremiah or Jenny will probably pull us back in line. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, Leroy, without further ado, uh, actually, uh, um, I guess I should say Leroy is the horticulturist in Platte County and uh, is the berry grower himself. Uh, so that is the reason why we chose him to uh, be our victim today. <laughs> <laughs> so Leroy, if you would, please uh, go ahead and get started. Okay. Is that, can, is, is, is the slide showing up? We can yes, see it. And, okay. And now um, you need to go to, well, now you need to go to the, the presentation button and hit that. Uh, where was that? Bottom right. Right there. Okay. Okay. Um, today, I just a little bit of background. Um, I've always been interested in raspberries. I had a couple of ants over in that little Snake River Valley that had raspberries. And as a kid, kind of used to hide in the raspberry patch, my cousin and I, and, and uh, always liked them. And um, Worked for some berry growers when I was in Nebraska, and after I retired from uh, the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, ended up back in Wheatland, Wyoming. Um, and so in 2010, uh, we started, we planted our first uh, uh, raspberries and blackberries and black raspberries and purple raspberries and that. And then in 2011 and 12, we expanded in some other things. So it's something that and there's a guy by the name of Jeff Edwards off to my right over here on, on my screen that has been kind of a guiding uh, light too. And he should be doing the presentation because he and his wife had uh, a berry business over in Henry, Wyoming, or maybe that's Henry, Nebraska. And, uh, and they had Wind Harvest Farms. And so anyhow, uh, we'll kind of go through some of the things that... Um, you know, on raising raspberries. And then, like I said, we've raised uh, blackberries and purples and black raspberries. Uh, there are several different, uh, when they talk about cane berries, that covers uh, raspberries, blackberries, loganberries, dewberries, uh, and then, oh, there's tayberries, boysenberry, and some of these won't grow in Wyoming. Uh, we do have a boysenberry planted, which is technically zone six. Uh, so we're kind of crowding at Wheatland is zone five, but probably the ones that I would stick with would be the, the red raspberries. Um, black raspberries should grow in, in more, a lot of Wyoming and same with the purple raspberries, but there's a lot of uh, thimbleberries, another one that uh, I guess does grow in the wild. Um, it's a 
a pretty power, a perishable berry, so you're not going to see it on the grocery store. So that kind of uh, gives you, when they talk about cane berries, it's a member of the rose, of the rose family. And so that's uh, where we started. So and wait a then, second. Wait, I'm going to interrupt you before you go, Leroy. Okay. Okay. So uh, just remember, all of these things are kind of related, except raspberries, blackberries, and dewberries. They're kind of their own... Right. Um, their own start, right? So right. Um, uh, dewberries were really common in Texas. Uh, so they are, you know, they need a warmer climate, uh, those types of things and don't do well in Wyoming. But uh, raspberries and um, blackberries are, there are varieties of both that will grow in Wyoming. And we've had really good luck. Uh, of course, last year was 2020 and uh, it was 2020, what can you say? But we've had really good luck with the black raspberries and the purple raspberries. With, and the purple raspberries, we'll get into that, is a cross between the black and the red raspberry. Um, the black raspberry has a lot more thorns than what the red raspberry does. Uh, not as much fun to work with. A lot of folks uh, call them black cap uh, is another name for the black raspberry. And so they will need to be trellised. Um, but but it's it one, go ahead. Yeah, it, it can be very confusing. We throw out a lot of names and just know that they're mostly all related. <laughs> right. Um, and even with the raspberries, there's a difference. Some are thorn free, some are th or have thorns on them. And the same with blackberries. I know Jeff had some of the, what I refer to, they're wild blackberries, but they're the thorn type. Um, and then we've got the trailing variety, which is the thorn free. And so, you know, uh, if you've ever picked the, the upright varieties, they're not much fun to pick with a welding glove. Uh, so the thorn free is a whole lot. It's the best way to go. On I, would, so that, I would, yeah, I would recommend that the blackberries are nasty. They're not fun to plant. They're not fun to prune. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, it's like wrestling a uh, rose bush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with 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 extra with with uh, thorns on steroids. Yes, exactly. So we got um, a quick question, and it's okay. a little bit off topic, but it, I mean, it fits in the berries family. It's not a bramble, from my understanding. But uh, we have a question from Cheryl: Will elderberries grow in Wyoming? Yes, I think they will. Uh, we've got elderberries here, and they have done really well. So, if this was from Lyme, and I lived there for ten years, yes, I think elderberry would do fine. Okay. And it just depends probably where you live in the state on how well elderberries would do, right? If right. you get over there, Afton, uh, um, Star Valley area, probably not as much. Um, Laramie, uh, I don't know, would, would elderberries do well in Laramie? They should do all right here. I see them growing up in the mountains. I don't remember uh, yeah, what I think, elevation that was. Cause it was yeah, so and the thing I like about the elderberry is kind of three things. Number one, it, it's an excellent fruit. Uh, it's a beautiful flower, so it's an attractant for pollinators. And then in the fall, uh, it makes a, a nice um, fall setting for, you know, if you want to do for um, flower set arrangements and things like that. And from the only thing I've seen, we've had them for about eight years and very disease resistant. We've had very little problem with the elderberry. So, yeah, it's one that I that we've got and I like. And Great, elderberry. yeah. So give it a try, but it doesn't fit in the bramble thing. No, no, it does not fit in the Bramble family. Yep. Um, some of the elderberries, this is going down a rabbit hole, are described as earthy uh, flavor. So, Jeremiah, do you know what that means? I do. I don't know if I could explain it, but I well, understand taste, the concept. They, they taste kind of like dirt. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Leroy. <laughs> well, and uh, the th but but it makes excellent syrup. It makes excellent jelly and stuff. And so the elderberry is is a you know it's it's one it's a plant that you can use. It's a pretty plant, and uh, it's it's one that you can use. Plus the birds eat it. Um, so some of the things we want to cover today, and and Jeff uh, will be chipping in, um, is planting location, the planting, how to plant the plants. Um, the various types and uh, and there's a difference and this is where uh, Jeff will probably step in there's a difference between the floricane and the primocane which uh, on the raspberries in particular um, and then the trellising which we'll talk about uh, the practical applications of the of the different varieties of berries 
and so site selection, and this is something that uh, didn't really realize until we started planting. And then, you know, like I said, I've, I've relied on Jeff quite a bit. Uh, you know, part of what his job with the extension is in specialty crops. And so, uh, not plus everything fact, he knows. He, yes, and that's why I had so many wrecks. <laughs> Touche. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you don't want to plant it into where you've had uh, tomatoes, potato, or I mean, yeah, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and that, because there are, are some diseases that can transfer over into your berries. Something that's not specifically mentioned here that I would strongly recommend is if you're going to plant berries, be sure to get rid of the grass and the, and the weeds, the alfalfa. We went into an existing alfalfa field. And as folks know, alfalfa has a deep root system and it's pretty hard to get it rid of it once you plant it because it is a uh, broadleaf plant as are raspberries. So uh, herbicides don't work real well when you're trying to spray raspberries and, or alfalfa and you got raspberries in there. That just not, not a, a good option. So these are some things, I think the recommendation is probably two years from the time you've, if you've had peppers, potatoes, uh, those kind of crops. It before you plant your raspberries. Uh, so do stay, that's just some things to consider. And what's the concern with that, Leroy? Is it a disease transfer? Is it a, a pest issue? Well, what, 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 is, uh, what do we gotta it, be concerned about there? Uh, soil borne diseases. So it would be a disease issue, potential. Uh, we were fortunate, and I don't know about Jeff when, when they went in, I think probably the same situation. Ours was an alfalfa grass mix. And so that wasn't, you know, that wasn't an issue with us on it. And, it, and it's important to work up the site uh, before you go into plant and we'll get into the planting, but it's important to make sure that you have a good seed bed to plant into. Uh, that's, that's vitally important for the success. Uh, this, and I don't know, I know how we did this, uh, how we planted ours. We've got about, oh, six tenths to three quarters of, of berries and, and not just all raspberries, but we do have the elderberries and, and some other berries. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, we, we dug individual holes on ours uh, rather than a trench. Some This is probably a little deeper than what a guy would need to go, but it's critical uh, to bury the whole, the root system up to about where they've had them planted in the nurseries and stuff. So uh, what's your thought on that, Jeff? Yeah, that so um, to me, uh, if you want your raspberries to spread, a trench is best, and it doesn't have to be that deep, uh, about six inches or, or less, uh, and you want to lay those roots down in there. And if right. those, if the uh, if the plant portion, the above ground portion, uh, gets buried somewhat, that's fine too, because you probably will not have new growth from that. It'll come from the roots. So, right, um, it's uh, it's kind of a easy uh, plant to plant. Um, but we used a a uh, pull behind your tractor kind of planter and just pulled them into the ground. And, and the thing with, with Jeff and Diane, they had a lot more, uh, uh, you had what, about an acre, acre and a half of berries, something like acre, that. Acre and a half of raspberries, yeah. Right, and so, you know, that's a lot more than what we've got. And we so we planted all of ours by hand. Uh, and, and the critical to to make sure that that whole root system is, like Jeff mentioned, is is in there and, and covered. Um, the other thing we did, um, and there's, it's kind of controversial whether it works or not, but we used a uh, product called uh, polyacrylamide or hydrosource, uh, which absorbs the water and then as the plant dries out, it releases it back into uh, to the plant. And, and we've used that uh, successfully with just about everything we've planted. Um, you know, some folks don't recommend it, but uh, that was one of the products we used. There are several different names for it, uh, polyacrylamide, hydrosource, uh, and that. So, uh, but it is critical. And the other thing is, while we're on that, is when you buy your 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 berry plants, make sure it's a reputable nursery. Um, you know, some of them we we I know of people that have ordered and the plants were dry when you got them, and so make sure that it is a, a reputable nursery. Uh, there are several out there and that the plants arrive in good order, um, that they, they are uh, moist when you get the root system. The other thing is to get them planted as soon as you can. Um, you know, if, if you can't, then you can... Um, sometimes if so, you're... If go you're, ahead, Jeff. Uh, when you receive them, sometimes it's really difficult to tell if they're in good shape because <laughs> they look like this, little brown dead stick, right? right? So... Uh, 
you, you kind of have to go on a little bit of faith when you're planting them. And uh, if nothing happens uh, two weeks after you've planted them, there may be some issues. So uh, just keep watching them and, and uh, uh, things should work out. And if so is it a case with, with these raspberries or like, I'm thinking like trees or even like grapes, we'll get bare root plantings like this. And, and a lot of times I recommend that you soak them in a bucket, like put them in right. a bucket for kind of 24 hours, whatever, let them get fully hydrated, hydrate themselves, keep them in a fairly temperate, like room temperature would be ideal, or even in a shop, just not want them freezing um, uh, before you plant them. And that just gets them a good, good drink of water. They're hydrated going into the soil. It, is that the same with this? I, I definitely think, yes, definitely, uh, Jeremiah. And also, we, there is a dip, which you got the polyacrylamide dip, uh, which looks more like uh, cornstarch. And that's what we did. We'd always put them in there for about two days in, in a dark, you know, in a pole barn or something like that, just to hydrate the plant before we planted. And then I'd use the polyacrylamide, uh, the crystals that were hydrated and put those in when we planted. And overall, we had great success with our, you know, we had very few die on it. And I think uh, those kind of things is, is, is a very important. So we had a water, what, what was called a water wheel planter. And uh, we had a tank of water on top of the planter and included the polyacrylamide into that tank of water. So as we were planting, there was water and the polyacrylamide being placed into the trench and then we would put the plants in the trench. So uh, it worked And what does, that, uh, what does that crystal or the polyacrylamide Crow, I can't speak this morning. Uh, what what does that do? Is, is it just a hydration for the plant? Does it last in the soil? What can you explain what that is? Yeah. It, it, so, well, go, go ahead, ahead, Jeff. Nope. It'll last in the soil. Uh, and actually, just as a side note, uh, when I was with the agency with NRCS in in uh, Lyman, Wyoming, uh, we did some plantings on rangelands planting with uh, with the hydro source on some dryland grass plantings, and that, and that was the goal because it absorbs the water. And then as the plant dry, as the soil dries out, it releases that water back into the soil. And, but the, you know, it's not gonna last forever. So you have to rehydrate that, you know, is water for the water of the plants or whatever. So yeah, it, it's a crystal uh, and then it absorbs the water and then releases it back to the, to the root system. Um, we've used it even on apple trees and stuff like that, that we've planted. Isn't and so as you there? irrigate those plants, then that crystal right. is automatically gonna rehydrate, right? right. And so I guess in my mind, I'm thinking that probably would be very ideal for a, a sandy soil type condition, mm -hmm. right? That's going to struggle to hold moisture retention. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Leroy, isn't there some concern that if you want to be uh, classified as or certified organic, that uh, that's unacceptable to use polyacrylamide crystals? I've heard that, um, Jeff, and I, you know, we're not organic, so it's not anything that, yeah. uh, that, that I've dealt with. But to answer your question, Jeremiah, yes, up in, in that Warland area, they've actually done some work with high, uh, polyacrylamide on uh, furrow irrigation up there uh, quite a while ago. So, yes. Yep. So, uh, uh, you had mentioned, and, and maybe we can wait for a little bit later on in your presentation, however you want it to flow, Leroy, but we have a question that's come in and says, how do you know if a nursery is reputable or not? Um... There are some that I wouldn't recommend, and I don't know whether they're still in business or not. Uh, but, um, you know, I guess uh, Stark Brothers, I think, is a good company. There's um, Berry Hill Nursery. Um, Jeff, you've got some. What are your thoughts? I know there are. Yeah. Um, Norse Farms. N -O -U -R -S -E, Norse Farms. Yes. Uh, they're out of um, Massachusetts, but they're uh, they're nationally uh, national suppliers. So. Uh, uh, they were pretty good to work with. So do you often look for ones that perhaps serve colder areas of the U.S. when you're looking for raspberries? When you're looking for berries in Wyoming, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is and helpful. I, <laughs> and I think it's important to look at your, your, your planting zone. You know, having lived over in western Wyoming, a lot of that country in the Lyman, Cokeville, Afton area, that's, that's zone three. So you'd want to make sure, you know, over in that area, I wouldn't recommend blackberries. Uh, black raspberries, most of those are zone four uh, and above. So I think with over in that area, uh, probably is Look at stuff that's zone three um, and that. 
Great. Well, I think the thing I would add, at least when I'm talking with other nurseries, may it be trees, may it be that, licensed nurseries, looking into that, making sure they are uh, a licensed. Also, uh, a lot of times with a licensed nursery, at least in grapes, I don't know for, uh, for raspberries or blackberries, but when you get into a licensed nursery, they are screening their propagation stock for diseases. Right. Right. And so then that that plant that's coming to you comes with a bill of health, a clean bill of health, essentially, that you're not getting an infected root stock to start with. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I look for a reputable nursery. We have some reputable nurseries here locally in Wyoming. Uh, they could be your your local nurseries. Right. And just knowing and working with them. Uh, a lot of times if they've been in business for years and years and years, they're pretty reputable just yeah. off of their reputation. They may not be licensed, but they're a good good source. Picking up some uh, nursery stock or that at a, a Walmart or a Kmart right. or a, the box stores, Home Depot, that um, there, it's not that that's not good plant stock. Those come from nurseries, but you just don't get that assurance that you would from a reputable nursery, I guess is how I would look at that question. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, so the next thing, Jeff, and I'll let you kind of cover this part uh, because it is com the, the confusing between the floricane and the primocane. Um, and you think I can explain it better than better you? Than, <laughs> probably. <laughs> it, is, it, it really is confusing. Um, so, so yeah, so when we're talking about raspberries, there are people will talk about two different types. There's this uh, primocane type, which um, uh, traditionally is, um, if you can see in this particular slide, that it's the uh, first year's growth, okay? The primocane varieties only fruit on first year growth. So they are a little bit easier to manage, I guess, uh, because at the end of the season, you can go in and you can cut all of that off so that the next year you will have more primocanes that are producing more fruit. Now the floricanes um, produce, well, let me, one more thing about the primocanes is that uh, they are known as fall bearing berries. Okay, they will only produce later in the season. The floricane varieties are generally shorter and uh, they produce fruit on second year wood. So you'll allow that primocane to grow. You won't trim it down over the winter or the following spring. And then that following year, they will, Leroy jumped off the slide, they will, they will develop these lateral branches and the fruit will develop on those lateral branches. So the maintenance portion for floricanes is in the third year then, after those have fruited, you leave the primocanes that grew that year that you have fruit and then you trim out the floricanes. Uh, so you have to be really selective in your pruning if you're growing floricane varieties well and that sets up your pruning regimen right you need yep. to know what type right of bramble you have and that dictates how and when you prune so to speak is that a fair right. statement that is and a I, fair yeah statement. and i think probably all of us get those questions that that raise raspberries and and when we first started we had both fall and and summer uh, varieties and i was pruning the fall bearing so you could get two crops and you can do that you prune off the top and it'll fruit off the bottom but on a small scale like we were doing that's an awful lot of work because it's all hand work uh the the summer bearing ones uh, and we'll get into a few varieties you take off the top or you can end on that so what then Jeff was doing this when they were doing it. What I did end up doing is on the fall bearing ones, uh, getting a, a blade for my weed eater, a uh, brush blade for the weed eater. And so I'm taking those down right to basically to the ground. Uh, and that, and so you're, you're only getting one crop. You know, the way we first started, you could get two crops off your, off your fall bearing raspberries. We, it's just a whole lot easier. I mean, when you're on your hands and knees for about two weeks pruning, you know, after a while you get a little tired. So it, it becomes um, a management tactic, right? It, it really what, does. Whatever becomes the easiest thing to do. And like you, Leroy, uh, since we were growing an acre and a half, I wasn't going to crawl on, around on my hands and knees and prune everything. So we got a sickle bar mower uh, to pull behind the tractor and just went through and cut all the tops off in the spring and then uh, collected all right. those things up and mulched them. 
And and for those up in the Riverton area, probably know of Greg Jarvis, uh, Greg and Kathleen, they had uh, Raspberry Delight Farms. Uh, uh, Greg would run through with the swather and, and yep. take them down. And so it's just a whole lot easier. Plus it does uh, kind of eliminate some of the disease potential that you may have in your berries. Um, so when you, when you cut that down, do you just leave it as a mulch on top for the nope. winter? Do you pick that up and burn it? What, where yep. do I go with that trash? I would burn it, get yeah. it off, get it away from there. You know, and I had another implement where I was able to go through and pick it up and, and mulch it. So I've turned it all into compost and then used it elsewhere in my garden. Right. So there's a bunch of different varieties or a bunch of different uh, tactics that you can do with it. Uh, but if you burn it, uh, you know, you're eliminating that disease, potential di disease pool. And, and so, we'll get, go ahead, Jeremiah. So if you're in a fall bearing and I don't know I have a fall bearing crop, what happens with that primocane? The second year will it not fruit it'll develop into a floricane but the amount of fruit that you get will be significantly less had right. you uh trimmed out the old the old okay so and that's the easy method is is go right. in with with fall bearing brambles mow them down prune them out whatever method to remove them down to the ground burn that compost that get it completely away from there and you'll have better fruit production. Mm -hmm. So here's on a different perspective of that on the opposite end, right? We have a question from Miriam. And she says, I have raspberry bed that is probably six to seven years old. It is still doing well, but I'm curious to know if there's a time that comes when the plant should be pulled and replaced, do more to age and productivity rather than any disease or nutrient issue. As in, do they have an end of life point that I need to be thinking of? Uh, typically from the research that I've been, we've, we've had ours in for 11 years. So 15 to 20 years is not uncommon for a raspberry patch. If you do your pruning, you know, clean out the dead canes and keep your, your beds clean. So, you know, they're not, if you plant raspberries, you could be in it for, for quite a while. And to keep in mind, they do sucker. And so, you know, you need to plant them where you want to keep them because if not, they'll probably show up where you don't really want them. That's a good point. Or we also had a question. Oops. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Or be on a mowing regimen and, and keep them corralled. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremiah. So we had a, a question come in after we were talking about reputable nurseries. And uh, Cheryl asked, could you name the nurseries in Wyoming? And for me, I can't name all of them. Uh, off of Facebook, Cohen Flowers has, has recommended Droves, great gardens, Cohen flowers, all licensed and local suppliers and growers up in my area, which would be the Bighorn Basin, uh, at least in Park County. Uh, we have two. We have JNS greenhouses and then we have northern gardens. Uh, do you guys know of others in the state? Yeah, so if it's the same Cheryl, she's from Glendo. So if anybody knows any over by Glendo, by La Laramie, um, when Mill Hill has been here for a long time. So there's one of the sources that we get raspberries from. Okay. Because here in Wheatland, uh, I'm not aware of any. I know there's a nursery over in Torrington. Jeff's probably familiar with them, but I don't know what they what they handle. Um, yeah, there's a couple. Um, and yeah. they, they will have fruit as well, uh, but they won't, they won't be bare root. They'll have taken what they received and they will pot it uh, just because it's, they're going to be able to keep them longer and be able to sell them right over a longer period and, of time. and be a healthier stock for you that's the benefit yeah. of potting yeah. Yeah. yeah right what's next leroy next okay we're going to talk a little bit about trellises uh this is um what we've done and this, and the picture i'm showing you is for our black raspberries and blackberries and purple raspberries we do not have our raspberries trellis there are some varieties i know jeff and diane over there had uh uh, some of theirs were trellised because some of the some of the canes uh, aren't very strong and they do tend to tip over, especially with these slight breezes we have in Wyoming. We don't have wind in Wyoming; we have breezes. They're uh, sometimes sometimes really strong breezes, and so um, it, wind is bad for tourism. So I use the term breezes. But anyhow, yeah. So it is probably advisable to trellis some of the red raspberries and some varieties uh, you can actually go in and tip them so they don't get so tall but like Jeff said some of them actually get fairly long and 
this this row closest to the edge of my screen is the uh, purple on this end and then the black raspberries on the far end and then we've got some other black ones but these are all uh, the blackberries and again they're all trailing type and uh so both wait, of them wait. go ahead when you say trailing type what do you mean okay trailing the 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 cane will come down and tip into the ground and the same with the black raspberry the blackberries so you need to put them up on we've got a double double t trellis you can see so what i go in and do is tie the bottom part of the cane to the bottom wire kind of like you would with grapes and in the top uh the taller canes uh, up to the top just to keep them from uh tipping into the ground um plus on both black raspberries purple raspberries and blackberries you're supposed to tip about four inches off of each one of the tips of the of the cane and so this way it kind of keeps it from it's you're able to manage your fruit better and able to get to it because blackberries uh, kind of like the darker spots and so it provides more shade for um, for the plant and that but but the raspberries you can do the same thing with a, maybe a little less elaborate type trellis. Leroy, you keep you keep mentioning tipping. What what do you mean by okay? Tipping? What on uh, Jeremiah? What the tipping is is, and I don't know whether my arrow shows up, but like this plant, this cane showing up right here, if you leave it, more than likely it will come into the ground, come in contact, and form another berry. It's it's kind of like it'll form another it'll it'll plant it, it's another plant propagating into a new plant. Right, and it's kind of like strawberries. We'll do this. It's kind of that same concept with strawberries, uh, some of them. And so this kind of, plus the fact that when you get them out here, uh, you know, mowing around them and, and that is, is a problem. So that's why I try to keep them corralled. And right. black, blackberries don't do it as much. And one of the things when we planting raspberries, red raspberries, the recommended spacing is about two foot apart in row. And the uh, black raspberries, the recommended, and purple is four feet between each one of these plants. And blackberries, we've got one variety, uh, Doyle, they recommended eight feet. And the other varieties we've got is four feet. So it depends on your variety. Great. So Leroy, we got a question from Michelle. And she asked, I was, one, I was under the impression from my research that raspberries and blackberry plants had to be separated by a certain distance. Is this true? And if so, what is that distance? Uh, you will read that. Um, and in, Leroy, in, in Leroy's case, it doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think, Leroy, I think what that comes down to is... Um, a lot of the uh, selected lines that people would use were uh, had um, disease issues, mm -hmm. right? And I think I think what people were trying to do was limit the transference of diseases between uh, their reds right. and their blackberries. So, um, for for our area, since we don't have a lot of humidity and we don't have a lot of disease pressure or problems, it becomes le much less of an issue. Uh, unless you're someplace on one of the coasts where the humidity is higher and they have disease problems and stuff like that. And I think the other part of that issue is is what was in the plant before. I mean, if you've had other wild berries around, like wild blackberries or something like that, uh, you could have those disease issues that were in an existing, uh, you know, as you can see, we've got a lot of uh, bare dirt and stuff like that. So I wasn't too concerned about it uh, for that reason. Uh, but I think if we'd have had other raspberry varieties and, and stuff, then yeah, I think it's something you need to, be, you need to pay attention to it. Yeah. And we, we had a blackberry, wow, I can't speak today either, a blackberry variety. And we planted it right in one of our rows with our uh, raspberries. Um, it didn't, it, it survived too. It's just that blackberries, the variety that we chose wasn't um, suited for our environment. So we ended up taking it out. Right. And just to the right of, of this, uh, this third trellis here is raspberries and they're about 10 feet apart. My rows, when I first set them up were about 10 feet apart. Great. Um, go ahead. No, no, that's great. Um, so hopefully we answer that. Uh, it's not as big of a critical issue but the plant spacing between plants sounds like it's a bigger issue right. that way. And it depends on the variety of, of what space they need around the plant. Right. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. 
and I try to thin our raspberries back. Um, but if you row with raspberries, you, you know, that two foot kind of keep your rows narrow. Sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, and then the, the reputable source, we talked about that local is good. Um, you know, berry color, berry size, firmness, flavor, freezing quality and winter harvest. And, you know, I've been asked, do we, do we mulch our plants? I don't know whether you guys did or not. We don't it's mulch. Not. Um, yeah. And I, for two reasons. Number one, the strong breezes we get, probably the mulch would end up in our neighbor's hay field. And number two, I've always kind of had the feeling that it's a potential if you've got those plants mulched uh, to harbor diseases, uh, your fungus and stuff like that. So I don't mulch. I mean, if they're going to make it, they're going to make it uh, kind of that that philosophy. I think the, if I remember correctly, we mulched with straw the first year they were out just to try to protect them a little bit, but uh, didn't worry about it after we after were, that, after that. Yeah. Um, talking you know, about go ahead. straw blew away. <laughs> well, um, <thank> you. <laughs> we were going well, to probably the other thing to mention on the winter hardiness and, and that it really goes back to the picking the, the right variety for the zone, right? Getting the, the correct plant for the right area. Yeah, and if you're looking online, all these qualities should be stated about a particular berry mm -hmm. that you're trying to purchase, or if you have a if you have a catalog, or if you are at one of our nurseries in the state and you pick one of these containers up, there should be a tag on it that tells you all of these different things um, about it. So it should tell you if it has an earthy flavor, right, Jeff? It may not tell you that. <laughs> we've got we've got some plants that Jeff really isn't very fond of, and he's he's a little too blunt sometimes, um, like goji berries and a few things like that. But anyhow, um, you're trying to make me make a face, aren't you? <laughs> um, the uh, gee, now I lost my train of thought. I don't know where I was going with that. Um, but we, we planted 13 different varieties of red uh, between summer and fall and, and did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, to see which one survived the best. And number two, if there was a difference in flavor and hardiness and that, and definitely on the blackberries, there is a difference in flavor. We've got four different varieties and there is a definite different flavor and the different varieties. So- Well, and same with the red raspberries too, Leroy. There, yes. Uh, there are flavor distinctions between them. Mm -hmm. uh, we had five varieties of red and a yellow variety and they were all, they all had little subtle differences that, uh, you know, it's entirely up to your own palate whether or not you like them. Right. So those are some things. One, the Boyne uh, is listed as a, as a summer bearing one, but a couple few years ago, we actually had it produced twice. Uh, Boyne's been around for a long time. Another one that I know a lot of people have is Lathrum, which is an old, old red summer variety um, that, you know, it's hardy. Uh, we've got it. It doesn't produce as well as the Boyne. Um, so Boyne is one that, that I think if I were looking at a red raspberry for summer variety is probably one I'd recommend. Uh, we've had had good luck with it and good survival rate on the Boyne. Um, and it, it keeps well and, and we've had very, very little uh, dieback on that one. Um, primal cane variety. Now, Jeff and I were talking before we went on the air. Um, the, the polka is the one that we don't have. I'll mention Ann, which is a, a yellow raspberry. Uh, really love it, but it comes on late. Uh, it's, it's a fall bearing one, uh, beautiful, sweet, flavor but it it's one of the last ones to come on and about that time it starts producing that's when the frost shows up so um but it's a nice berry <laughs> it, it really is and and i know jeff uh, and and uh, i'm going to quote you but you guys actually when you had your commercial kitchen made some jams and stuff out of it and because it's so sweet, you don't have to add as much of the pectin in that. Um, well, it does have a higher pectin content than right. the red, which is really weird because uh, when Diane was making jam, it would actually start to uh, set up while she was get, trying to get it into the jars. <laughs> and you're not going to see it in a grocery store because it doesn't keep as well. I mean, it, it's one of those you better pick every day. Yeah. Um, Caroline is an is is a, a fall bearing variety that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's uh, one Car Caroline is a nice berry, but it does not do well in really hot weather. Mm -mm. Uh, so what happens is, um, if it gets above eighty five degrees, that plant basically shuts down, and you're trying to get 
as many growing degree days as you can. So what'll happen is it'll stop growing. And then when the temperature gets cooler again, it'll start growing again, which delays the maturity of that particular berry. And uh, so, so that one might be pretty good for something like Laramie, right. where their summertime temperatures hit 80 degrees, right? Right, yes. Uh, although it needs a long, it needs a lot of days to uh, actually get fruit out of it. So, but it's a really nice tasting berry. It was one of our favorites when we were growing it. Autumn Bliss is one that we've got that's done well. Uh, Dinkum, which is an Australian variety, has done well. Heritage, Fall Red are all good. All good varieties have been around for a long time. And, and all of these have different um, maturity dates, right, Leroy? So, right. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're reading in the literature, you're going to see a reference that says, uh, fruits two weeks earlier than Heritage or fruits two weeks later than Heritage. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot unless you're actually growing heritage. <laughs> With this heritage fruit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it's it's really hard, but the majority of these are beginning to fruit, if you're lucky, the end of August and will fruit through frost or freezing. So um, uh, the Joan Jay, we're currently growing it inside of a high tunnel. And I think we started having fruit in the end of July mm -hmm. uh, and we're able to keep it through October, I think. Diane will correct oh, me later. Yeah. Diane will and correct I know, me later. <laughs> then I know for us, with, with both varieties on a normal year, last year wasn't a normal year, we'll start picking the, the summer bearing ones probably mid-July, and then it'll transition over to the fall. And some years, like Jeff said, we're, you know, outside, we'll be picking into October, depending on the year. So by doing that, it gives you a longer growing season if you are selling berries. Uh, Joan Jay is is one that both Jeff and I have had. I really like it. It's uh, thornless. There is a thornless uh, red raspberry. Um, it, it's just a nice berry. It's a nice big berry. Um, and these plants are kind of floppers. Uh, for whatever reason, they probably will need to be trellised. Right. Just wanted to mention to you guys, we're going to be running a little short on time. We got a little over okay. 15 minutes left. So okay. Okay. just so we okay. pace ourselves and get through the presentation. Yep. Yeah, Himbo Top is another one that we've got. It's a good berry. Um, so we'll just kind of go through these. Uh, the Palana is another one uh, that, you know, both of us have had. Uh, uh, you I wanted me to talk about Polka, though, too, right, Leroy? Yeah. So, so both Polana and Polka were um, developed in Poland. Uh, they're, they're shorter in stature, generally. And the uh, Polka was uh, an issue for us to pick because the calyx, the white part on the inside of the berry that uh, stays around on the plant after you pick them, were kind of arrowhead shaped. So the berries really had to be uh, ripe and mature in order to get them off of the plant. So the variety is polka. Right, as yeah. in the dance. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Another I, one is the Did Polana. I misspeak? No, no, just clarifying so people okay. understood. Yep. <laughs> and fertility, and this is, I think it's important, uh, whether you're planting berries or, or grass or whatever, take a soil sample, find out what you need. One thing I found out when I, when I sent my first sample in to a lab, uh, they had never run tests for berries before. So they didn't have a recommendation, but they do have now. Uh, normally, you know, I'll, I'll do, uh, and, and berries like, uh, they're a nitrogen liking plant. And so I'll use an, a granular application in the spring and then I use, uh, run it through a drip system in the fall, or, you know, throughout the year, uh, mixing some, uh, and in high pH soils, uh, the, what I use is, has got some sulfur and iron into it in addition to the nitrogen. So I run that through the drip system probably once about every three weeks to six or every three weeks to a month on my drip system. Uh, Planting in an old corral, a lot of times you get uh, too much, a lot of nitrogen in your manure, plus you get a pretty good weed source, uh, which you really don't need. Uh, high organic matter, high nitrogen, you would get a lot of um, uh, top growth and not a lot of fruit growth uh, or fruit development. Right. You get really good looking canes, but uh, very little berries. And and since how I'm not the technical person, but this is a, a disease that, or a disease, a bug that showed up uh, oh, in Wyoming. Hold on, hold on, Leroy. Hold on. 
Let's, we got a bunch got of questions. Few, we got a bunch of questions flooding in. Okay. And so let's do that before we jump into the pests okay. and that. So the first one I have is Michelle asked, what are the chances of putting a less cold hardy variety or varieties in a hoop house as far as survivability? Should work fine. We've got it. I mean, Good. yeah, um, yeah. And they're fall bearing. And we a lot of times we can pick bears start picking in middle part of July, which is probably two weeks earlier. Last year was 2020, didn't work out that way. But we've actually picked, you know, not on a commercial scale, but we've actually picked berries uh, in the fall in November uh, in our high tunnel. So yes, I definitely would recommend it. Great. And this question, I might have to get through it. We'll see. We'll see if we can figure out the question. It comes from Connie on Facebook and are Lathrum the types that grow on the northern bighorns? So I'm guessing the Bighorn Mountains is what she means around the beginning of the Tongue River area. Um, that's the question. Do you know? So it's right? a, it would be a wild type. They, they, we yeah. Have, yeah, we wouldn't have any idea what yeah. those raspberries are. And the okay. wild raspberries are generally a lot smaller. Uh, and you have to fight the bears and everything else for them. But if it's up in the mountains, it, it, it is like Jeff said, it would be a wild raspberry. We, there would be no way of telling. It wouldn't be a domestic raspberry more than likely. And the question is, would they grow in the Bighorn Basin? Um, the ones that are on the north side of the Bighorns? Probably. The probably. <laughs> I think as long as you gave enough water and stuff, so you're yeah. shifting right. it. From, uh, yeah. I, often, I most often see the wild raspberries in the mountains, and so they get more moisture just right. from right. the melting snow and stuff. And, and they're our me, smaller raspberry. That is our raspberry patch. For my family, we go to the Bighorn Mountains and pick strawberries and raspberries, and mm -hmm. that's what we do. And uh, uh, the other thing I would just mention is usually wild varieties are not desirable in a garden setting, only because of what Jeff said. You get very small berries. You're not going to get the big plump uh, right. because they're not bred for that. Right. Um, and so if you go with a more cultivated variety, you're going to have probably better yields and, and more, uh, more production out of them and probably more consistently. Um, but it doesn't mean they won't grow down there in that. Uh, Cheryl also asks, uh, does there need to be cross-pollination? Uh, they're self-pollinating. They're self-pollinating. Yeah. Good and question. It's in, and it's interesting to watch the bees work the flowers, though. I oh, mean, it, it's, a, it's yeah, a good it, time. It, it, it really is. It's fascinating. <laughs> One I'm going to cover um, in this, and, and I, I hate to give Jeff credit for anything, but um, in 2012, which was a hot, I mean, 2012 was just a brutal year. And so we had a lot of berries that were just mushy. And Jeff happened to be stopping by on his way either to Laramie or back. And, said, and I was the bearer of good news, wasn't I? Yes, Leroy? he was. He said, I'll bet you have the spotted ring fruit fly because they had it. And and so he said, just pick some of those berries, put them in a Ziploc bag, put them on the counter for a couple of days and you'll see little white larva coming out of them. Sure as heck, we had the spotted ring fruit fly and to quote Jeff, it's just a nasty damn bug. Um, and this, this one showed up uh, yeah, but it's pure protein, Leroy. Oh, it is pure. And they, you know, what I tell people, you know, you uh, post cereal puts protein in their cereal. And this way, if you're eating the berries, you're getting protein with your berries. But it's pretty much devastated, not just the, it's the soft fruit industry, blueberries, uh, raspberries, blackberries, uh, and it gets in into the fruit, lays the egg, the, the female does. And then as the larva grows, it just, it makes the fruit basically unusable. Um, so what we've done and on the screen, it kind of shows the, the uh, lifespan of it and they can, they can repopulate on a normal year about seven generations. So once you get them started, uh, they, they are very prolific and um, they can do a lot of damage. And one of the things, and I, rather than getting into the screen sharing and stuff, uh, this is what, it's what a, a, a trap that I, thanks to Jeff, but there are several different um, patterns out there, uh, Oregon State, uh, uh, Michigan State, Cornell, on the traps that you can use to, to make to, to trap the, the uh, fruit fly. To see and if you have them. You're, you're, you're basically you have, monitoring your plants. Right. You and have. what we've done is I put out, you know, I don't like to use a lot of chemicals on our, on our berries. Uh, 
So I'll put out around 100 of these trying to trap pretty heavy that and you can use like apple cider vinegar and soap. There's some, if you look online for spotted ring disophila or spotted ring flute fly, there's a lot of different information out there on, on ways to handle it. Um, there's really no organic, um, you know, biological, I guess we could say to, uh, to take care of it. There are some lures that you can buy, Century and Tracy makes lures you can put in these traps. Leroy, uh, have you, sorry to interrupt, but have you tried Pyganic? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, okay. I use Suzuki Trap is, is what I use in my lures. Py, in, well, in my Pyganic is considered or, an organic insecticide. It, so okay. um, it, it could be, but it would only control the adults. It right. has to be timed just right. So this is one that if you raise berries, uh, more than likely you probably will end up with this guy. Um, you probably already have it probably already have it not not to not to ruin your day or anything but you probably have it <laughs> and if you if you pick enough berries like like we have you can look at a berry and pretty much tell um if, you, if it's got the, the the maggot in it i mean it it's you can open it up in the middle of sunlight and pretty soon you have little white things crawling yeah, around in there yeah one of my this is one of my biggest things that i notice is if you pick that berry and there's juice on the calyx or if the berry as you go to pick it doesn't quite have the same sheen or um, uh, it's not as firm as the others right. around it um, so yeah within if you pick some infested berries within two days they just turn to juice uh, if you put them into a plastic bag so my recommendation you know if, if you don't want to get into the spraying and there are some some applications that that you can use with one day post harvest or seven days, whatever, uh, it would be to pick daily and, and keep ahead of your, of your crop. Um, and it, like I said, it's, it's devastated pretty much the soft fruit industry, including cherries. And I think Jeff said, even found it in cantaloupe, right? When you guys were uh, raising? I've seen it in cantaloupe. Yeah. yeah. Well, but only if it was damaged. Right. If it was damaged. So it's one that's out there. Um, this is one that, that is, is, you know, I guess we, we, we really got hit with it and I know it's, it's around, I've gotten some calls on it from here and then from other places. If you look at this, and I thought it was, uh, was cane blight, uh, which is a fungal disease. And if you look at the cane, you can kind of see the red on the kind of the burnt orange on the left side. Well, with cane blight, it's a, it's a fungal disease and it, you get symptoms are the same. And so we've got two really good people on campus, our plant pathologist, Bill Stump, and our bug guy, Scott Shell. So I sent some samples two years ago over to Bill thinking I had cane blight. And so I got an email back from Scott saying, I've got good news and I got bad news. You have the rose stem girdler. That's the bad news. And so what happens is this thing works its way up through the, the cane. And then when it starts to girdle it pretty soon, it kind of looks like a blow down in a forest. You go out one day and you got a bunch of canes laying on the ground. You pick those up the next day, you got a bunch more canes laying on the ground. So we sent some more in this spring or this past spring and uh, to make sure that was, you know, well, we knew we had that one and to find out. So what we're doing and, and, we're using the Utah State, there's a Utah State fact sheet that was printed in 2015 as kind of our guiding document as far as a spray pattern. There's really no biological control for this uh, uh, girdler. Um, and it's a real small little bug. And so to see it on the cane is, or on the plant is, is pretty possible. So we've actually started a uh, spray program around and I'll probably tweak it this year probably start a little bit earlier in May and then run it through um, mid part of June, which also helps us a little bit with the spotted ring flute fly. So this is one that um, was found in Utah in 1955. Uh, so it's been around for a long time, but I think it's just making a reappearance uh, with a vengeance in the last four or five years. So the bottom line is if you are growing raspberries and uh you have a windstorm come through and you have canes that have snapped off. It could be this, or it could be some other insect right. pets that kind of do the same thing. So um, don't just ignore, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't just ignore those plants that have snapped off. There is something going on that you need to investigate. And, yeah, and if you take in, uh, a knife and kind of dissect that cane, more than likely you'll find where it's girdled into that, that girdler as, as 
uh, channeled into to the cane. So, um, you know, take a little time. And and I I was kind of going up the wrong tree because I was thought we had a fungus and it's it's a bug. And so um, if Leroy had identified it as a fungus or not sought help from right. the guys on campus and started a fungal uh, pathogen yep. treatment. He would have wasted material. He would have been spraying things he didn't need, and he would not have controlled the problem. So, and, and that's exactly right. And that's and and that's why it's important to send those off to the to the folks on campus. Um, so this is one that that is out there. Um, and then the, the other one, the top one, is a European paper wasp uh, showed up uh, about five years ago, I think. So wait a minute, Leroy, why are wasps a problem in raspberries? Uh, because they like to eat raspberries and so do <laughs> yellow jackets. And this particular one, if you, as they say in amateur radio, they have an eyeball, you know, that's when you actually talk to another ham radio operator, you have an eyeball. So if you have an eyeball with one of these here, uh, European paper wasp, they'll have yellow antennas. And the other thing, about three years ago, I tried a bunch of different uh, lures uh, with different yeasts and that. And there's a fact sheet that Whitney Crenshaw put together out of CSU. And you just made them angry. It makes them angry and they don't trap real well. Uh, they they're, they just like their, their uh, um, they like their raspberries. And on a good year, they will eat a lot of raspberries. And just as a side note on this, me being allergic to bees and, and folks, if you do have allergies to bees, uh, they, they're, not, they're not too friendly. Uh, they're not as bad as yellow jackets. They don't have quite the attitude that yellow jackets, but they, anaphylactic shock is not a good ride. I can speak from experience on that. So um, it's just one that's out there. It showed up, uh, yeah, big time. Yeah. And this is kind of uh, a side view of, of what we've got, you know, the often when I say we're right next to the airport, we literally are right next to the airport because those buildings off to the west are the hangars. And that looks um, like it was probably taken in uh, the end of July or the middle of August. Not last year, I no. can guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, yeah, it would have been. And so, um, that's kind of what we've got. And then we've also got uh, elderberry and, and uh, uh, currants and some other plants on the, this row over here on the far west is uh, choke cherries. And if you see over on the right, those ones with the great big white flowers, that's elderberry. the elderberry. And so uh, we planted the, the choke cherries on the west side kind of as a windbreak, plus the fact that you know, we sell the choke cherries to a guy locally to make choke cherry jelly. So, you know, it's kind of serving two functions and feeding the birds too. Um, so that's kind of what I had. Um, uh, one, of the th one of the things we didn't get into is irrigation. Irrigation right. is a must. I, you might have noticed in one of Leroy's slides that he was using drip tape or drip yep. lines. Uh, it's really important to be able to provide enough water to these things. And and what and Jeff and Diane had the tea tape, which is theirs was buried. We went above ground with uh, emitters, about half gallon emitters, and spaced those where every one of the plants, every two feet, on the raspberries, and then every four or eight feet, depending on the blackberries and stuff. So, yeah, um, in a and it, and they the other thing is it takes about a gallon, an inch of water a, a week. So you know. Black or raspberries, blackberries, the brambles do take water. You can't just ignore them. They're not, and, and then the hottest, in the heat of summer when it's 90 or 100, those plants will look stressed. I mean, you, you can tell when they're they're lacking the water. And when the berries start coming on, they really need the water. Right, pushed. and the same with the with the nitrogen when they're, when they're producing. That's what I was just gonna ask you guys is, um, it pretty much in any plant, it doesn't matter if you're growing wheat, uh, corn, you know, tomatoes, you know, anytime we start setting seed or setting fruit, that water demand of that plant yep, just yep. starts going up and up and up. Um, but especially in your berries, I, at least when I'm talking to folks with grapes, um, you got to think those berries, they're a high percentage of water. I don't know the exact percentage, but probably 75% on up right, is water yep, yep. content of those berries. So the water need is a must. Uh, oh, got a few questions oh. that have come in. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, it's okay. I was going to mention, Cheryl asked, how are you keeping any critters from getting your berries, including deer, antelope, and moles, voles, Bears. et cetera? <laughs> Bears. We're, we're fortunate. Um, People. 
yeah, people, uh, <laughs> we've got this patch here and then off, which would be off to my left. Uh, there's another small patch with blackberries and raspberries and stuff. We've had a few deer in uh, over by the elderberry that have come in, um, a little bit of damage there, but we're close enough to the airport and the runway's off to the north there. So that hasn't been an issue. Uh, it really hasn't. Um, the moles and stuff like that, again, we haven't, we haven't run into that. Our biggest problem is the fruit fly and uh, probably the European paper wasp and the yeah. stem, grow stem girdler. It's those little things you have to watch out for. We never had any uh, issues with uh, deer or um, antelope or anything that you ask about, Cheryl. It was just the other little critters that we right. were trying to deal with. Great. Another question off of Facebook. Uh, Nancy asks, um, can raspberries and blackberries be grown in containers? So I'm guessing she's thinking like in container production, not grown in containers for a little bit and then planted in the ground, but solely grown in a container. So I have, I have raspberries in a raised bed. It's nothing more than a big container. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Just needs to be a big container then right. to ma maintain the root mass. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question, well, this was a, a comment made by Carrie. Uh, bumblebees seem to be the best and primary pollinators of my raspberries. So I thought for me, that stimulated a question in my mind. You guys said that these are self pollinators. Do they need insects to pollinate them? Can Not you discuss the helps. pollination a little bit more is what I, where right. I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> the bees help. Um, they do a lot of it, but you know, they're wind pollinated, they're pollinated by other insects as well. Um, one of the issues that we are asked if we're growing uh, raspberries in a high tunnel, how do they get pollinated, right? Because normally you don't have a lot of insects flying in and out of there. Um, in ours, we don't anyhow, and they do fine. They produce, they produce berries. So. And with our high tunnel, we can roll up the sides and the ends. And so in the summertime, you know, the berry, you know, the insects can get in, you know, the bees and stuff. Sure. But even though I'm allergic to them, I, I just to watch the honeybees and the bumblebees as they do their thing, you know, I find myself just watching those guys. I mean, they're busy. They, they, they're doing yeah. their job. Well, and if you know a bee producer or a, a person that keeps bees, uh, talk to them and ask them if they could set hives near you if you have a large patch and want to, to uh, have them be pollinating for you. And one quick comment, and it's in Jeff's presentation, you know, having done this, I guess, on a small commercial scale, if you're going to get into it, you need to find out if I'm going to do it as a home you know, just for my home berries, or if I want to do it as a business. And as a person that's definitely interested in promoting specialty crops, uh, niche markets and that, you know, there isn't real opportunity for your berries, the strawberries, raspberries and stuff like that. But I would caution people to start small. Uh, it's better to have a fender bender than a head on collision. And number two, if it's a hell of a lot of work, I mean, you're, you know, there's some good return, but if you're out there when it's 100 degrees picking berries through all these plants, you wonder what you were drinking when you planted them. And so, you know, and, and I would encourage people to to look at that. I think right now there's maybe only one or two commercial raspberry yeah. producers in the state of Wyoming. And, and there is a definite demand for that. And then the same with, with strawberries. And Jeff and Diane, I think they found out with strawberries. I mean, it's everything you do is on the ground. Yeah. Well, it, you know, there's other issues too, right? We have wind, we have hail, we have drought, right. we have all the other things that could go possibly go wrong and do. And um, it, it is a good way to think about to start small and see if you, this is something that you actually right. want to ramp up and, and try. Um, Jenny T is asking, uh, since containers are above ground, do you think they would need to be put in an unheated garage or something like that in the winter? Um, probably. There probably needs to be some other layer of protection if you're talking about a three-gallon pot or something. Um, uh, so, I don't know. I, I haven't grown them in containers other than the raised bed, and I'm sure that the soil freezes inside the high tunnel in the middle of winter, but yeah. And 
we do water our I try to water ours in the high tunnel two or three times during the winter because you know even though those plants are dormant they're still alive and outside yeah. uh, they do get some moisture so I'll take the hose and and water those plants down uh, two or three times during the winter just to make sure that there is uh, soil moisture which reminds me I need to get out there and do that too me too <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so, Leroy. You, you gave me a project for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> we got, we, let's revisit the pruning. We had a question come in earlier and I was saving it and I missed it when we were talking about pruning raspberries. So, and I think that's really critical on, on these bramble patches is understanding that, uh, the, the pruning. So when is the best time to prune our raspberries and how far down do we take them? We take them to the ground is what I remember. So, uh, you know, um, when is the best time? I think Leroy and I might have a uh, differing opinion on this. Um, some people trim or prune in the fall. We always pruned in the spring. My that's feeling, when, okay. That's when uh, I do. Uh, my feeling is that we get such little moisture in the wintertime. If we do have a snowfall, I'm going to try and trap it as much as I can. Um, but you'll see it in the literature, prune them in the spring. Uh, fall or prune them in the spring. It just depends on what your uh, practicality is, I guess, what what you think you need to get done or what you're able to do in the fall or how you want to trap snow or not, that type of thing. And yeah, and even when I was pruning the fall bearing ones, um, well, even the spring, I'd, I would kind of wait until things greened up so I knew exactly what I was to be pruning. So no, I definitely wait until fall. Yeah. And, or, I mean, until spring, I mean, until spring. And part yeah. B of that, all the way to the ground. Yep. Always to the ground. And when you say you would trap snow, Jeff, it's the brambles that's trapping the snow and, right. and leaving those canes up right. creates a snow drift on them and, right. and hopefully gives them some moisture in the spring. Right. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question from Mary off of Facebook. I have raspberries alongside a lawn and against a fence. The top leaves sometimes are yellowish. Is this an iron issue? More than likely. Or, yep. Especially uh, if it has the dark green veins. Yeah. Um, P pH is really important to raspberries and small fruit, those types of things. And if your leaves start yellowing, they need to um, have a shot of iron. Mm -hmm. Or if you uh, choose so, you can add uh, sulfur to try mm -hmm. to reduce the pH. But the sulfuring is a long term, every year type of activity and in the product we use um it, like i said it's got 15 percent iron uh, i think it's like six percent sulfur or i mean six percent iron and some sulfur so it does do that but but uh particularly uh raspberries are are susceptible to iron chlorosis as are the boysenberries we found out and honeyberry uh, which is uh hackensack is another berry we've got planted and so some berries are just definitely prone to and especially in these high pH soils like we've got in Wyoming. Yeah. Uh, the other thing also to, to keep in mind is as you, uh, you might be able to see behind me, as you go through the end of the season, uh, that plant is taking as much nutrients as possible and trying to shove them into the berries. So you will have leaf loss. Uh, they will turn yellow. Um, and uh, I don't know, Leroy, you might want to unshare your screen so people can look at this. Um, but uh, that is just the natural process of the plant as you go throughout the season. So I think this was a uh, picture in uh, uh, mid-October. We'd had a couple of frosts. There's some things going on. But the yellow leaves and uh, uh, the leaves dying back, that's natural progress right. of the plant. Another question. So for what it sounds like for both of you through our show, you guys have talked about planting these in rows and that, and they're on, it looked like at least in, in the pictures, they're on flat ground. And so we have a question of can brambles be grown on a hillside? And this question is coming from the little snake river Valley. Sure. Yeah. I've seen them grown yeah. so over in snake river Valley. I've seen them grown on hillsides. <laughs> Right, naturally, that's where you find them. At least for me right. in the Bighorn Mountains, they're yeah. usually on a rocky slope. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, another question has come in from Miriam. Uh, did you already address white spots on the tops of the berries? I have this issue from time to time. It always is on the top of the berry. 
I do see wasp on my berry. The foliage looks great though, but just on the berry, there's a white spot. Could so be sun, sun scald. Yeah, that would be a sun scald. So I think what she's talking about is on the on the berries behind Jeremiah. Uh, each one of those drooplets, which are the little round balls, some of them will be white, um, and that is generally a sunburn or a sun right. scald type uh, response. Yeah, and that's fairly common. Too much sun, sunlight, yeah. basically. Too right. much exposure. Right. Okay. Yep. yep. The next question is, uh, oh, a follow up. How do you prevent it? <laughs> well, there. I was going to mention that there are some varieties where the uh, the berries are more protected by the foliage. Mm -hmm. uh, Polana is one of those, so uh, it makes them a little bit more difficult to pick. But um, if the uh, if the berries are tucked up in the foliage as the cane is growing, right. you won't get any of the sun scald problems. A variety like Himbo Top. Uh, where the uh, berries grow in a mass at the end of the cane, they're more prone to get sunburnt or sun scald. And so it just kind of, it's a varietal thing. And can I've you, seen it, I've seen you, it on autumn bliss too, uh, more because it, it's, it's more of an open plant. Can you do a shade cloth at all? I right. mean, that would be very difficult yep. to keep in place yep. with our winds and that, but that's, a 30% yeah. shade cloth to cut yeah. down that exposure, right? right? No mm -hmm. more than a 30%, but yeah, that could work. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question from Cohen on Facebook, uh, nitrogen. And I'm guessing just a fertil fertilizer recommendation. Do I need to apply uh, nitrogen? When yes. would I apply that is my speculation. So, so I'm going to jump in here, Leroy. This is where you talked about at the beginning about uh, a um, uh, soil test. Uh, take a soil test, understand what those plants need, and then um, June, July, and August. So whatever, whatever the recommendation would be for your fertilizer needs for the year, you would divide that into thirds. In the first of June, you would make an application. The first of July, you would make an application. And the first of August, you would make an application. Great. And since brambles are a perennial plant right a woody perennial plant do do you guys usually recommend a, a balanced uh, fertilizer when you're applying so a 10 10 10 a 20 20 20 something like that i've heard that as a general rule of thumb for any woody plant i i try in the spring i try to look for something higher in nitrogen with with some p and k and iron um, and I use granular in the spring and then in the summer, I, I go more with the, the liquid um, mix. It, if it's your only option, it would be the best option. If, if, you know, if, you're, if you don't take a soil sample and you think that the plants need fertilized that year, it would be acceptable. But remember, you don't need a lot. Uh, it, you do not need a lot of fertilizer. And how you know is through a soil sample. That's the best way to, to find out. That is key. Yep. Yep. Great. Well, that's all the question I see have come in, Leroy. You made it through. You kept it on, on the track. We appreciate it. This was a great presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks to Jeff for, not, for picking up the railroad track. <laughs> keeping you on the rails giving you some <laughs> keeping me on the rails yeah <laughs> you no, like i said uh you know i give jeff and i give each other a hard time but jeff and diane had a really nice uh deal over there and uh you know learned a lot from him and then like uh jarvis is up in shoshone and so you know if we take the time to listen to each other um you know we can all learn well, and that's the other thing too, Leroy, if, if, uh, if our listeners or our watchers have uh, the interest in doing this, find somebody else who's doing it and talk to them. Right. Um, you, you will learn a lot. <laughs> and usually the folks who are growing uh, uh, and are successful at it are willing to share what they're doing. Uh, so those types of things. Um, uh, I, I did want to mention, um, we moved into a house that had a raspberry patch already established. We did not know what types of raspberries they were, whether they were prima cane or flora cane. And so um, it was a patch, it was a big area. So I just took the lawnmower and mowed strips through it, one, so I could get in and pick it. 
and two, to try to figure out if it was primocaine or fluorocaine. It ended up being a fluorocaine variety. So um, it, you know, if you if you inherit something like that, you still have to figure out uh, how to how to best manage it. And you knew it was a fluorocaine because it didn't fruit that first year. Right. Sorry, Jenny, what was that? I was going to ask him the same thing. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Well, with that, we, we have had, we're over time as always. We get chatting and, and really sharing some good questions there. So uh, again, just want to thank everybody. Thank you, Leroy, for your time and expertise on this and your knowledge. Uh, thank you for all our participants joining us and, and helping us out. Um, and the big thing we want to say is we do this show for you. And so thank you so much for joining and engaging with us. Hopefully this is beneficial and helpful for you. If you miss part of the show or if you need to share it with your friends or, or want to revisit it, we do record these and we throw them up on the Barnyards and Backyards Live website, which is found on the Barnyards and Backyards website. Uh, there is a list of all the recordings there. And if you want to know what the future shows are, there's a full agenda there for this spring. Look it up. We All the shows we did last year are archived and uh, can be found on that, that website as well. So get back in there. There's a treasure trove of information and literature and videos and resources linking you out to other uh, websites and that. So please spend some time on there. Uh, that's why we're doing this is to help you and give you the information that will benefit your, uh, your projects in your life. So with that, uh, if you have further questions and you want to reach back out, uh, you want to reach out to Leroy or you want to talk to Jeff or myself or Jenny, uh, or any, any of our other educators in the state, reach out to our extension offices. We have local extension offices in every County in the state of Wyoming. And we have one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. We're here to help you. As Leroy said, we even have some specialists down on campus. And if you want to connect with those specialists, our entomologists, our plant pathologists, our horticulture specialists, anything that way, connect through your uh, extension, local extension office, and they can connect you down there on campus and, and help answer the questions they have. Jenny has already beat me to the punch as always. Um, we need to hear from you. We're doing this for you. And so Jenny's posted up a, an evaluation into the chat box or in the comments, depending on how you're joining the show. Take a few minutes for that survey. Give us a little input and we do read them. And last time we even were able to weave in a little bit of rockets and space into the conversation <laughs> because that's what was in the comments in the, in, in the evaluation. But we really do read those and we appreciate your time and energy on that. So you have a few minutes, please fill that out. With that, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. Again, thank you for your time, Leroy. Thanks, Thanks guys. Uh, bye.